Hi, everyone. Welcome back to episode 23 of Digging Through Dominoes. I'm your host, Terry Anderson. And in this podcast, we dig through the dominoes of our past to figure out what the heck is going on today and to have a brighter future. I've had a difficult time this last week. How about you guys? Drop it in the comments. Let me know how you're doing. How are you coping? Have any of these episodes helped you? They have me. What I have today, I bought a book. For those of you that are watching this, Instead of listening, this is the cover of it. It is called The Emotionally Absent Mother, How to Recognize and Heal the Invisible Effects of Childhood Emotional Neglect. It's by Jasmine Lee Corey. I really thought, 14 years of extensive therapy with the last two very focused, last three very focused, that I would be able to handle this book. As you know, it was very difficult for me to even acknowledge my childhood because I love my parents. I love them so much and I miss them more than I can say. This book struck a chord. I got it because I was watching a video on YouTube from Katie Morton. I'll link her below too. And I'll link this book, which is a, it's an affiliate link, but it's, you know, she, she was so excited. She said, you need this book. You need this book. You need this book. Not talking to me, but you know, talking to everybody. So I thought, well, I've got to get this book. This book kicked my ass. And since I've been listening to it, so many things are coming up for me. And I'm not, I know I have to face them so I can make, continue to make progress, continue to climb that mountain to emotional recovery. I've got, I don't know how far up the damn mountain I am at this point, but I know I've, I've made, I've made huge progress. This book is very good, but you need to be ready for it. At least for me, it put me in, it made me realize things that I still had covered. And it brought things up for me that I had no idea were there. You know, I I thought I had it pretty well, you know, taken care of. I thought, yeah, my mom was emotionally neglectful, emotionally abusive. She wasn't there for me. I can't say if she was or not for my brothers. I know she didn't want to be pregnant with me. I know she didn't want me as a child. She just got married, and here, not even a year later, I come. I was told by her my entire life, and my mother died in 2005. That would have made me 40, no, she died in 2006. That would have made me 44. That I was a horrible, horrible, horrible baby. My aunts, on the other hand, remembered it quite differently and told me I was an adorable baby, that I was precious. That, And so I, you know, I was, I was at this odds. I had these two people that I loved dearly telling me that I was an adorable baby. And then I had my mother telling me what a horrible baby I was. I thought I had come to terms with that. Then I started reading this book. I do recommend it. And we're not going to get all the way through it. But I want to hit some highlights. And we may or may not come back to this book in the future. But I really wanted to get it started and, and let you guys know about it. In case you may want to get the book yourself and go through it. If you do, I would say be very prepared. If you're new on your journey, opening up your childhood, or if you hold your parents in very high regard, in my opinion, you're not going to be ready for this book. 
but you may. It's really interesting the way she has this, and I'm going to read from some of it. And as always, I'm going to give a little bit um, about me in here and my experience, because when I do that, I feel like people feel like they're not alone. They can see an actual face to put with their experience that is telling them, hey, I understand what you're going through. And in your comments and in your messages, my gosh, you do the same for me. And I have to thank you for that. But this, this book, oh my gosh, chapter one, it's talking about mothering. And I think in chapter one, we're probably going to skip through a lot of it. I found it really interesting that, and I had never really thought about this before, but that in Proverbs, it says that a mother is like a tree to them. I never really thought of it that way, but my gosh, it makes perfect sense. And if you've ever seen the inside of a placenta after a baby's born, there is a tree of life. If you haven't seen that, I would, if you're interested, look it up because it's amazing. It is a tree. And we had the privilege of seeing that with when our first grandson was born. The author says a tree of life, a tree providing shelter, home protection, a tree you can climb on and eat from, a tree that seems big when you're many times smaller, a tree that is your tree. As a side note, we're going to get back to this, but as a side note, when my first grandson was born, my daughter made the decision to keep the placenta and we planted it in front of our house with a tree. It's a beautiful, beautiful maple tree. And it was just a symbolic message of my grandson's incredible formation of his birth. And it's a, it's a reminder every year when I look at it how much my grandson has grown, how much he has progressed, the storms he's gone through, the triumphs he's had in his resilience. It's a great reminder. So when she wrote about the tree of life, man, it kind of blew me away. Wait, the cords are hang, hanging up here. She goes on to speak about a book by Shel Silverstein which that name in particular really brought up a lot of memories. My mother bought many of those books for my daughter. But she's speaking of The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. That was originally published in 1964. I don't remember any, I don't remember those books at all. I think the only thing we got were Cat in the Hat. You know, things like that. And it's considered a classic parable of love and devotion. It's a, I'm quoting her, it's about a boy in a tree that loves him very much and gives him everything she has. She lets him swing on her branches, gives him shade to sit under, apples to eat, branches to build a house, and even lets him cut down her trunk to make a boat. In the end, the tree only a stump, and the boy an old man. She gives him a place to rest. In that she that book is clearly providing the perfection of motherhood, which I think we all know not everyone can meet, especially those who had their own traumas. You know, and I think of my mother, I think of what she went through. Much of was unspoken by her and I heard through my grandmother, my aunts, and just from listening in on conversations. My mother didn't have that. Her mother divorced my grandfather. I don't, I don't even know how old my mother was when they got a divorce. And my mother was left raising at least one of her sisters and was very resentful of that. 
in my opinion, she may not have been. I think what my mother missed out on was her mother and the connection with her mother. And before I go on with that, I'm going to tell you kind of how that affected me and my daughter. When I was born, first baby girl, my grandmother was over the moon from stories. I know that she stopped by all the time to see me. She always brought me gifts. She was loving. She was giving. She was kind. She took me when she could. And most of my childhood memories revolve around my mother. I mean, not my mother. Revolve around my grandmother, who we called Tina, which was her name. And one of my aunts specifically. Now, my mom was very envious. I didn't realize this. When I look back, I can see it. My aunts tell me this. Uh, Jeff has told me this. And when, in looking back, I can see how envious my mother was that I had that relationship with my grandmother. And that had to have hurt her deeply to see that I was getting something that she had longed for her entire life. And so that put me at a, a huge disadvantage. I don't think it was conscious. I don't know. My mother's no longer here. I can't talk to her. And, you know, in all reality, it's, I don't think it's something I would ask her. It just seems very disrespectful. And my mother was not an open person. She was very quiet. She didn't speak a lot about much of anything. And when my daughter was born, my mother did the same thing with my daughter that her mother had done. The only difference was I was, since I had lost my grandmother at a young age, fifth, almost 16, I guess that's not too young, I was elated that my mom was so giving and wonderful and loving to my daughter. And one of my aunts, you know, was after my daughter was born, she came over and said, let's go, let's go garage sale, sailing, sail, garage selling, garage sailing, whatever. We went to see, a, we went to a lot of garage sales and we were looking for baby clothes. And it was so funny. We went to one, and I don't know if my aunt will remember this or not, but we went to one and I wanted to name my daughter Carly Elizabeth, but I, I didn't. I, I chose a different middle name because that's what my mother wanted. So I'm, I am speaking to this woman, and her daughter was named Carly. Little did I know that this was, that was going to be the generation's, generation of Carly's. I think my daughter had like five or six other Carly's in kindergarten. But the little girl, the baby whose clothes we purchased, her name was Carly Elizabeth. And they were just beautiful. And, and my aunt just made me feel so special when she did that. And I knew my daughter was loved. I knew my mother loved her. I knew my aunts loved her. I knew I loved her. My gosh, she was something I had wanted all my life for all the wrong reasons. And I made huge mistakes. But she was beautiful. And she was fun and she was a good baby and my mom adored her everyone adored her and so that's the big difference between I think I was very accepting of that and very excited that this child that I had brought into the world my mother loved I think and in, in going through this book what I think is the reason behind that is the fact my mother was never proud of anything I accomplished, or at least she never told me she was. And here I built this baby. I carried this baby. I remember being in the labor room. Back then they had labor and delivery rooms. Yeah, that's how old I am. And my best friend was in there with me, and she's counting contractions, and she's timing everything. And I remember at one point just saying, I need my mom, I need my mom, I need my mom. So she went out into the waiting room and said, hey, Terry needs you, and my mom declined. She wouldn't come back. That kind of uh, hangs with me today. That was very hurtful. 
Although she drove like a mad woman on the the way to the hospital. So I don't know if it was to get me there or to keep the seats of her Toyota Corolla clean. Then she, she goes into something about who can mother. It's not just a biological mother. It's an adoptive mother. It can be a grandparent. It could sometimes even be a father. It can be aunts. It can be family members. It can be teachers. I did have teachers that realized what was going on at home and they did step in to take care of not really certain certain situations but they knew they made sure I knew I that they they made sure I knew they were there for me she goes on to say that although not every mother every woman can adapt to motherhood which was clearly my mother's situation when I was born that there are support systems out there even later in life. And I'm finding that. And if you watch my last or listen to my last episode, I spoke of a relationship I had with a woman named Margo who really filled and helped heal a lot of wounds, a lot of cracks, a lot of open holes that were left by the absence of good enough mothering she's goes she goes on to talk about good enough mothering and that mothers don't have to be perfect i mean like like i said who the heck can be perfect none of us can be but as children we see our parents as perfect we see them as all-knowing until we get you know maybe like junior high or high school and then that kind of goes out the window so let's go on And talk about uh, the good mother messages that she speaks of in her book. She says, how mother responds to our basic needs tells us about our importance to her. Is she generous and giving to us? Is she joyful? Or does she meet our needs with a sense of burden? I can say I've done both, unfortunately. And with an attitude that you're bothering me. So she wants this, this woman, what is her name again? Jasmine Lee Corey goes on to talk about good enough mothering messages. Here are the ones that she lists. I'm glad you're here. I never felt my mother was glad I was there. I, I cannot remember in my lifetime my mother saying or expressing or showing me that she was glad I was there. That really hurt. It, that really hurt. Another of the good mother messages is I see you. My mother preferred not to see me and I'm not really sure why you know maybe it was she was just too young she how old would she have been I was born in 62 she was born in 41 so she was 21 years old when I was born I was 19 when my daughter was born and believe me those that's way way too young to have a baby especially in today's world but I see you My mother, as I said, preferred not to see me. As for my brothers, I don't know. We're just speaking about me here. I remember being locked out of the house. I remember her going to her bedroom and locking her door. I remember... I do know that she was the coach of my softball team, but I don't remember any affection or being proud that she was. She was a room mother when I was in first grade, and I don't remember any feeling about that I think maybe she was trying to make friends because we were new in the area but I don't know I have no reference point for that at all the next one is you're special to me I don't remember that I I don't ever remember feeling that way I did with my father very much so I felt I was special to my dad I did not feel that with my mother. I saw it. I thought one of my brothers was very special to her. 
I saw her going to him. I saw her comforting him. And so I may have had the wrong idea about that because after my mother died, he said, I, I, I thought you were the favorite kid. And it's like, dude, I thought you were the favorite kid. So we both had different notions. But no, I did not feel special to my mother. I felt special to my dad. I felt special to my grandmother. I felt special to my aunts. I felt special to my grandmother's siblings and to my great-grandfather. I love you. No, I felt like an obligation and a, um, something that she had to do. My mother, in the time that she was alive, never said the words, I love you. She didn't even write them in cards if she sent a card. If I got a card on my birthday, she didn't even write love mom and dad. It was just mom and dad. Your needs are important to me. You can turn to me for help. Okay, my gosh, here's a big one here. I've got like three minutes before I've got to shut the camera down for to cool off. My needs were not important to my mother. There are so many times. I can remember I was in sixth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, and I had to take this paper home to my mom that I had no idea what it was about. And I had to get my mother's permission. And it also invite her to come to school. And I was so excited that she would come to school with me for this presentation. But she laughed at me, signed it, and she said, I'm not going. I had no idea what it was, what it was about, until I sat in the classroom and I found out how people change from kids into adults and all the process in between. My mother wasn't there for that. And when that started happening to me, and this brings up a horrible memory for me with my daughter, but when that happened to me, see, I can't even say it because that's how much shame it feels that was put on me with asking my mom to go to this. When that happened to me and I told my mother, she laughed at me. She never told me how to use anything. She never told me how to take care of myself. And one time when my brothers were out of town, I don't know how this happened because I know, it, I know this wasn't me because I thought that these things were nasty and disgusting. And I made sure they were wrapped and got rid of them in the outside garbage. Well, my brothers were gone and my mother came to me and she said, Terry, get in that bathroom and get rid of those nasty things in there. And I didn't know what she was talking about. And I went and I looked and it was under the cabinet. Things had been just like stacked up. To this day, I have no freaking clue what happened. Did I dissociate? I don't think so because I clearly remember going to the trash. And I remember the night that my daughter came in to talk to me. One of the things, it was night, she scared me. I was on the computer, she scared me. And I yelled at her before I knew what she was going to say. With my daughter, that is one of the biggest regrets I have. I feel like I emulated my mother, although in a much more horrible way. Yeah, that, that time with my daughter is one thing in raising her that really stand, stands out as a distinctive mom fail in my book. It has haunted me since that night and I oh, I wish I could that's a night with her I, I really wish I could redo but I can't things are what they are all I can do is recognize and say hey I was wrong and I'm sorry the next one is I'm here from you I'm going to make time for you. I don't remember it. I don't remember that at all. I remember my grandmother making time for me. I remember my aunts, especially one of them making time for me. My grandfather, my dad. I do not remember my mother ever making time for me. That could be just a block. It could not be accurate 
That's just my memory. But man, what a strong memory. This is answering so many questions for me. I hope, you know, if you do decide to get this book, I hope it answers some questions for you as well. So the next one is, I'll keep you safe. I can think of three instances where I felt my mother was keeping me safe. One, my middle brother bit me in the back because I was playing Lincoln Logs and he wanted them and she grabbed him up by the arm. I don't know what happened to that. And two other times, I don't know what, what it was with this house that we lived in when we first moved to Arlington in Texas. One time I was standing out front waiting for the ice cream truck and I was standing in a pile of ants and she jerked me out of that. And another time I was in my bedroom and ants were I wasn't looking at the wall. I guess I was turning the other way. She must have glanced to my room on the way to hers and she saw the ants that were present and she came in and she jerked me out of bed. Those are the three times I remember that she would be there for me and keep me safe. I can remember many times when she didn't keep me safe, sending me in the two to the doctor's office alone when I was seven years old way too little to know not to way too little to realize doctors were not supposed to do what this doctor was doing and I remember a time on my 10 speed that I had saved my money up and bought I went I was riding down the road and I flipped I was probably doing something stupid and I broke my arm and my ankle a woman saw what happened and she picked me up and took me to my house and my mother was just very put out that something happened and wouldn't take me to the hospital. Well, I kept whining about it because it hurt and I couldn't walk. Mom finally took me to the hospital. I don't know how many hours it was after it happened, but it seemed like it was forever and we got to the hospital. She parked like at the very end of the parking lot and I'm hopping along. She's walking ahead of me. And another woman came up with a wheelchair and took me into the hospital and gave my mom like this real shitty look. And I remember being upset that the woman looked at my mother like that, but I also felt kind of validated, I guess. But no, my mother did not keep me safe. I mean, my gosh, you lock your kids out of the house. It's not keeping them safe. Well, maybe when I grew up in the 60s and 70s, it wasn't as dangerous as it is today. But no, mom did not keep us safe. Did not keep me safe. I can't speak for my brothers. Uh, the next one is, you can rest in me. No, we were not allowed to touch my parents. I never remember, I, I cannot remember my mother holding me. I'm sure she she had to have. I'm sure my aunts who are still living could say if she did or not. I don't remember my mother holding me. I remember my grand my great grandfather holding me. I remember my dad holding me. I remember my grandmother holding me, my aunts. I remember all of them holding me, but I do not remember my mother holding me. I can't say why. I can't say if it didn't happen or maybe I don't I don't know, but I I don't I don't remember being able to rest in her. One real vivid, or I guess there are two vivid memories I have of being able to rest is one with my great-grandfather. And you know, I was just a teeny little toddler running around the farmhouse and he's playing this unknown game to me, which happens to be called dominoes with all of these other like ancient looking men I think he was probably he had to have been in his 80s at that time and I was running around the house and I was just really tired and I was fascinated by the dominoes on the table and he picked me up and he let me kind of lie back into him and rest and another time I remember someone being there and allowing me to rest was lying on my, I think it was my grandmother's bed at the farmhouse. And my Aunt Susan was with me. 
And we actually have a picture of it. Maybe that's why I remember it so well. And she was reading me a book. I remember she would read me a lot of stories. That's my memory. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I remember her reading me stories. Those really That really stood out to me. It still stands out to me today that she would read me stories. I don't know if she was forced to or if she genuinely wanted to. But for me, it was a huge, huge comfort. The last one here that she has of good mother messages is I delight in you. My grandmother did. My grandfather did. My dad did. Although he, my dad with my dad, you know, we're talking about mothers here right now. My dad was kind of difficult to navigate the waters with. My mother was straight up cold. I loved her. She was my mom. Um, but delighting in anything, it wasn't me. I can, I can, I have memories of her delighting in my brother, another brother, but I don't have those memories for myself. I don't have those feelings. I don't have that body memory of that happening. And here are some of the things I find very interesting and very disturbing because these really pricked my heart. that this author says happens when we don't get those good mothering messages. The one about I'm glad you're here. When we don't feel welcomed or wanted, we may conclude maybe it would be better if we weren't here. I can remember thinking that from the time I was a little girl, not wanting to be there I would disappear into this fantasy land. I had a fantasy family. And that's what I would think about. I, Dang, I was disassociating when I was a kid. Or maybe I'm just putting a word to something. I don't know what the heck was going on. But I had a complete fantasy family. And my outlets were going to my, my aunt's houses. And watching them with their kids. Watching them cook. Watching them clean. Watching them love their kids. And laughing. That was not anything that happened at my house. And if you don't get that, this woman is saying that if you don't get that feeling from your mother, that message from your mother about you're glad you're here, it can lead to a severe sense of abandonment that lasts a lifetime. That, I can tell you, is one of the biggest struggles I face. And I remember one time we were in Kmart when I was a little kid and I was probably four or five years, probably five years old. I don't think they had a Kmart back around the farm. I was probably five years old and I got lost from my mother and I panicked and I was lost for so long. It seemed, you know, I was a kid. Maybe I was only lost for 30 seconds. Who knows? But I panicked because she wasn't there and I didn't know who to go to. And I was crying for my grandmother. And when my mother found me, I got in trouble because I was crying for my grandmother and not crying for my mother. Well, my mother had never been there for me. Who the heck was I going to cry for? The only person that had been, or one of the only people that had been there for me. I'm so glad. I mean, I'm not glad, but I, I'm glad I'm, I'm going through this after the death of my mother and not while she was still alive. Uh what happens when the I see you message is absent? She says, when we are not consistently seen, it can lead to feeling invisible and an uncertainly, uncertainty that we are real. The feeling of unreality can be subtle and generally unconscious, or it can be quite perspective persuasive and disorienting you know maybe that's why I had that fantasy family I yeah I, I don't know I felt other people saw me but my mom didn't see me I tell you going through this <clears throat> I don't know if you if, if you're watching this or if you can hear my voice this is still affecting me I've not really thought about the these things in this way 
the one you're special to me. Knock over my whole microphone system here. When we don't feel special to our parents, we don't feel cherished for who we are. We may even think mommy might like it better if I was someone else. I don't really think I had a true identity. I remember really trying to find a true identity, but I didn't. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't find an identity. I don't think my true identity really started to emerge until a few years ago. It's pretty sad. I don't want anybody going through that. The next one, I respect you. My mother had absolutely zero respect for me in any way. When we don't feel that our capacities and preferences are respected, we don't learn to respect these for ourselves. We may develop a sense of unworthiness and shame or fail to actualize our true potential. That's me. I never thought I was worthy to progress. And we end up setting ourselves up for less than. And finding people that will not stand behind us. That has all happened in my family. It's all very raw. It's all very, very difficult to even talk about. To realize, I mean... Oh my gosh, I thought I had gone through everything. I thought it was like an exhaustive hunt. And to realize these things, oh my gosh, it's so not. When we don't hear, I love you, we begin to feel we're unlovable. And that has led me into many a bad situation. We may contort ourselves in the hope if I conform to what others want, maybe they'll love me. You know, it's weird. I, I don't think I ever really had a true understanding of what love is or love was. It wasn't modeled for me. What I saw with my parents certainly didn't model love. My father would, I never saw my father stand up to my mother. I saw my mother demanding things of him and him doing it. And I saw my dad having affair after affair after affair and abandoning, abandoning us. That really left me, you know, I, I have to say I'm very lucky. I'm more lucky than a lot of people. And I realize I have it better than a lot of people because I did have people I knew love me. Without a doubt. I knew my aunts loved me. I knew my grandmother loved me. I knew my grandfather loved me. I knew they loved me. And when I speak of my grandmother, I'm speaking of my mother's mother. My father's mother, I don't know what was wrong with her, but she was not she was like, yeah, it wasn't cool. And there was like this huge feud between my mom and my dad's mom. And it, they were fighting over my dad. And it, it was just really uncomfortable. And my grandmother was really mean. And I had seen how she had used my dad as a pawn for year, years after years after year after year after year. And it was terrible. And it was very rare for my mother to voice her opinion on whether or not she liked someone. I knew her feelings on some things because of the way she reacted, but it wasn't common for her to actually voice her opinion. And she let us know in no uncertain terms she did not like that woman. The next one, if we don't feel our needs are important to our mothers, we start to feel our needs are shameful which I spoke about earlier about going into puberty and things like that. I mean, I think that's why there are certain words I won't use because to me, they're equated with shame and they shouldn't be, but they are. 
But we, we begin to feel that our needs are shameful and that we shouldn't have needs. When you have to ask to sit in your father's lap, that's embarrassing as a little kid. When you're embarrassed to ask your mother for things or tell her things because, you know, I learned at a very young age that my mother was not available. She was not emotionally available for me. And I know it was her own trauma. But she was not emotionally available to me. I saw her progress with each of my brothers being emotionally available for them, but I don't know to what extent because there was an extensive length of time growing up in that household that my mother and I did not speak. And there were physical altercations between my mother and me. You know, I regret those deeply. I don't know who started what, what, you know, I just would... She had no respect for me, and I think I really didn't have any respect for her because she didn't want me, um, and she made it blatantly, blatantly clear. And I'm not crying here. I'm just stating what the facts are so I can get over them and so that you don't feel alone. You know, last night I was trying to have a conversation with Jeff, and we were speaking of something that happened years ago. And he said, you should be ashamed. I said, you will not tell me to be ashamed. Shame is not an emotion, a feeling that I accept. And you shouldn't either. Don't feel shame. Shame is blame turned inward. Do not accept it. I'm here for you. What happens when we don't hear that? When we don't see that modeled? we don't see our mother being there for us. Well, that happened quite often. We come up with the sense, and I can see this with my mom, maybe, that she may have felt. We feel like we have to raise ourselves. And I kind of felt like that. I felt like we had no guidelines as I was growing up. My father was gone all the time. When he was home, he was cool. Uh, If, you know, he wasn't drinking. When he was drinking, he was even more cool, but it was very uncomfortable. But there were no rules. I didn't know the rules. I can't speak for my brothers. I didn't know the rules unless I broke one. They were never clear. You know, my kids had very clear rules, very clear boundaries. I think too much so when I look back on it. But we never knew until we were hit or punished or something what the rule was. So... um we, we did pretty much raise ourselves, or I did. When we don't hear, I'll keep you safe. And I have to sort of disagree with what she says here. I do agree with it in a sense. Without the sense of protection, we can feel overwhelmed by life and conclude the world is dangerous. I was sort of like a Mustang at that point. I had no boundaries. I was, uh, it was hard. I do feel like this. And then again, I don't feel like that. Right now, I do feel the world is a very dangerous place. And I feel that people are very dangerous. Mainly because of the decisions I've made. The choices I've made. That now I see were direct results of Parenting, childhood neglect, childhood abuse, childhood abandonment because my parents had traumas of their own. When we don't feel that we can rest in our mother, you know, that being able to have that rest and that comfort with our mom and being held is a very important aspect of connection. And my, most of my kids slept with me. Joshua wouldn't because he was, you know, he was different. He, he had problems from the very beginning with his autism. Michael slept with me. Cole slept with me. Carly slept with me. And I was always trying to play with them. Carly and I remember when I was pregnant with Cole, we would have dance parties to Prince's Purple Rain. And it was real funny because after Cole was born and I would, he was, if he was fussy, which he was rarely fussy, he was such a really good baby. All of my real babies were really good babies. 
But I'd put on Purple Rain, and he would just soothe right down. It was so funny. And I know he would probably cringe to even think of listening to that song today. If we don't have the feeling that we can rest in our mother, it becomes a time we need to stay alert or perform, and we never fully feel at home with her. I always had a longing to feel at home with my mother, and I never did. Never, never, never. If we don't get the feeling that they delight in us, we might conclude, I'm a burden that nobody wants. I wish I could disappear. I shouldn't take up so much space. We shrink ourselves and learn to hide our light. I hid my light for a long time. I tried to let it out a lot, but it it just kept getting dimmed. And I can see how I consciously or unconsciously played into that. You know, as I said, this is really, I thought I had this this topic covered with, you know, my mother and, and the problems, our relationship. And, you know, I knew she had traumas. But I didn't really know how much they affected me. Reading this book, I tell you the last, or listening to it, because I haven't really read it. Usually I'll read while I'm listening to it. But I, listening to this opened up so many boxes, so many wounds. It was like ripping the band-aid off of something to realize the depth. And at this point, you know, with with just as far as we've gone, and I'm going to stop here on this topic, but I want to explain a little bit more. Just as far as we've gone with the good mothering messages that were absent in my life, which were every one of them, hearing the words on the audio book sent me right back into that place of being unworthy untrustworthy, the fear of abandonment, oh my gosh, overwhelmed me. And last night, for the first time in years, I told my husband, I didn't want to take another breath. And I had been very, very proud of myself because that was something that I had gotten over. I thought those days were way behind me like a decade ago. And I understood where they came from, that I wasn't good enough. And when I read through this and I, and I see how much it mirrored my mother's disdain for me, I think my mother loved me, but she didn't love me. And if you guys can relate to that, let me know, message me, put it in the notes on the podcast on Facebook on YouTube and I would or email me because I know sometimes you don't want to just put this stuff out there but if you have an anonymous account put it out there I'll get back with you I try to answer all of my questions I try to answer all of the comments that come in but boy I was not prepared for this book And I've got therapy in about a half hour. And I can tell you one thing. This is what we're going to be talking about. It has shaken me that much. Which throws me. It throws me. I thought I had made progress. And here I am just feeling like I shouldn't be here. And I know that's not me speaking from today's perspective. I know that it's me reliving the way I felt when I was a child. And if any of you have felt that, I'm here for you. I understand you. And what happened was not right, but more than likely, your parent didn't have the tools to parent. I don't think any of us, like I've said before, have the full parenting toolbox. I wish we did. It'd be a much better place. We'd have much better adjusted children. 
But one thing that this is letting me do is look back and see, oh my gosh, how many mistakes I made. Not only my mother and how I fit with her, but how many mistakes I personally made as a mother. And if my kids listen to this, I just have to say, I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I wish I had done a better job. And you know, the more I think about it, the more I think that's one of the reasons this book is hitting me so hard because it's a double-edged sword. I'm reliving how I felt as a child and I'm seeing and realizing my own shortcomings and realizing how I felt when I was that little kid and I tried to do the best I could with my kids and knowing that I failed them is horrible. I do really believe I could have been a much better mother had we not been foster parents. You know, people ask me all the time or I see people, you know, should I be a foster parent? Should I do this or should I do that? And I can't speak for them, but I know it destroyed my family. It destroyed my, my oldest children's relationship with me because it took me away from them. I had to concentrate on problems of other kids instead of the needs and the wants and the loves of my biological kids. I really tried to give that to them. I really tried to, and I know I fell short. So guys, that's it for today. And please, hopefully we'll have another episode up next week. And then I may take a break because I'm going out of town. But you guys have a great day. Please leave your comments, your messages. Please give us a great raving review on whichever podcast platform you use. And you have a wonderful weekend and a great week. I'll talk to you next time.